welcome everyone at the event by the British Council. Uh, you can see it on the screen, but climate action to in higher education. Uh, today we're going to discuss how we get from ambition to reality and what really the role of higher education is in realizing the ambitions that we set upon in uh, Glasgow at the COP26. So I want to welcome you all, first of all, at this session. Thank you all for coming to Tivoli Utrecht. Uh, I'm very excited to see you all here, not just the people here in the room, but also the people online watching via our live stream. Welcome to you as well. Um, today we're going to discuss how students and staff, but also policymakers, can uh, make practically, uh, practical, sorry, and adequately, adequately approach the climate crisis, and really what the role, therefore, is of these higher education individuals. Um, the program. Uh, Oh, sorry, yeah. First, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me first. <laughs> My name is Anique Mona. I'm the chair of the Junge Klimaatbeweging, or the Youth Climate Movement. And the topic of higher education in the climate crisis is something that is very dear to me. Um, myself, I grew up in a small town in the south of the Netherlands, in a place where climate, the climate crisis or climate change was not discussed at all. Not at home, not at school, and not with friends and family. So when I was 18 and I went to, to university, went into higher education, I was actually, that was actually the first time that I was confronted with the idea of climate change and with the climate crisis. Uh, and you can imagine that I was stunned. I thought, how can I not know that it, this has been happening for years and how did I only find out when I went to university? Um, so right then and there, while I enjoyed all these classes and learned more about the climate crisis, I decided to dedicate my life to solving the climate crisis, or at least do my part in, in finding solutions. Uh, in 2020, I graduated uh, from my bachelor's at Leiden University, and I decided to join the Junge Klimaatbeweging, or the Youth Climate Movement, as a board member. I've done that for two years now, and right now, as I said, I'm the chair, which is super exciting, because I get the chance to talk to hundreds of thousands of young people and talk to them about what their idea of the future is really like. So what do we want in the future the Netherlands to look like? What, how do we want to eat? What do we want to eat? Where do you want to live? And what kind of housing? And what work do we want to do? Um, and then I get the honor to translate these ideas and perspectives into things that policymakers can actually make happen. So, very exciting to have that role, and very excited to have this role as well here with you today, moderating this event. This is one of the good sides of the job, <laughs> is what I like to say. Um, and I'm very excited to do this. I'm going to show you what the program of today is going to look like. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with a short welcome by Lucy Ferguson, who is the Deputy British Ambassador. Then we'll have a video message by Sander Gastra, who is the Director uh, General Climate and Energy at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate. And then you can see the program as in two parts. So in the first part, we're going to talk to students and staff from universities who actually experience firsthand what climate change and what sustainability is in higher education. Uh, and really introduce you to the, this topic. And then we'll have a networking break, which I'm sure you're all very excited about. Uh, and we get 30 minutes to kind of get to know each other in the audience as well. Uh, that is obviously mostly for the people here in the room and the people online. We'll also have a, a short 30 minute program as well. So look forward to that too. And then after the break, we get back here, and in part two, we actually get to talk to the policymakers. So in part two, I'm looking to collect a bunch of ideas of how higher education can actually implement sustainability, but then obviously we need these policymakers to implement these ideas and uh, uh, policies on a national level. So uh, very excited for that as well, and then we'll, we'll finish off with some closing remarks by Gen Jennifer Cosgrave, who's here in the first row, <laughs> who's the director of the British Council, Netherlands. Perfect. So um, I'm just going to point something out to you that I'm hoping that we won't have to use today, but I need to show you where the emergency exits here are. So these are here on the my right, your left, and there on the my right, or my left, your right. <laughs> so let's hope we can all stay seated during this event, but just in case anything happens, happens, that is where you need to go. Then for the online audience, a reminder that you can still send in questions, uh, not just 
all of the panelists here uh, will be very excited to hear your questions, and I'm sure you'll have many questions listening to their ideas as well. So if you're looking, uh, you're looking through the, the YouTube Live, uh, there should be a chat on your right-hand screen, uh, and you can fill in your questions there. So do let us know those, and then I can ask them for you. Uh, same thing for the audience here, by the way. Uh, I'm very looking forward to having you uh, be active in this discussion as well. It's going to be obviously a discussion between the panelists, but I, I see this as a bigger conversation with everyone here in the audience. So I'm hoping that everyone here who has a question will just lift their hand and let me know that you have a question, and then I'll have one, someone with a microphone run to you, and you can ask them to one of the panel members, uh, or to me, but I think they're more, more interesting. Um, <laughs> Then I think that was my starting uh, comments. Uh, then we go over to Lucy, who should be here. Lucy Ferguson, the Deputy British Ambassador to the Netherlands. I'll give her uh, applause. <laughs> Good to see you. And uh, see you. go ahead. Hi, thank yeah. you so much. Well, look, a huge, huge welcome to all of you, those of you who are here physically and online as well. It's really fantastic to see you. And a big thank you to our hosts for today's event, where we're going to be discussing, as you've just been saying, the role of higher education in the climate debate. My name is Lucy Ferguson, and I'm the Deputy British Ambassador to the Netherlands. I'm very proud of how the British government has prioritised tackling climate change. And that, of course, was particularly with our COP26 summit in Glasgow in November which resulted in 197 parties agreeing the Glasgow Climate Pact and reaching consensus on the need for urgent climate action. Since then, we've also seen the more recent IPCC report, which has urged us to go further and faster on climate change. We know we're seeing the effects of this here, today, in our lives, and of course for you with your futures as well. One of the things that is really important for me is the education aspect of this. I have two young sons. They're sort of this high, kindergarten and primary school. But I want to see climate change embedded in their education at primary school, middle school, high school, and on into university. One of the topics that was agreed upon in Glasgow was the importance of involving youth in climate action. But you know, and I know, that turning those pledges from Glasgow into action is now a priority. And that is what today is an example of. We don't want those commitments to just be words. We want to hear from you. We want to gather you. We want to hear your thoughts and ensure these are being included in the climate debate. I think there's one last thing, really, that I would leave you with, and that's picking up on that point. Today is your moment. Please contribute your thoughts, ask questions, do that in the room physically, do it online, but also do it in your lives outside of this. Higher education is about learning. I want to learn from you today. Our policymakers want to learn from you today as well. So thank you very much. I'll hand back over to you now, I think, but I'm really looking forward to being part of the sessions this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Oh, yeah, you can, no, you can keep the microphone. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Lucy. Uh, and I hope that by now everyone here in the room has realized that you're just as much a panelist as the people on the screen or on the stage here uh, today are going to be. So I hope everyone is prepared for that. Uh, just kidding. Um, the next part is going to be a short message from Sander Gasta, who is the Director General Climate uh, and Energy at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today physically, but he really wanted to be here, so he uh, recorded a video message for us. Uh, we're now going to enjoy that together. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we will discuss the central role higher education <coughs> plays in the realization of our climate goals. But first, let me tell you about those goals and how crucial they are. Because climate change affects us all. It increases the change of extreme weather conditions, which have more severe consequences for human nature than previously thought. And that is the conclusion of the UN Climate Panel IPCC that presented a new report last week. Hundreds of scientists all around the world worked on this report. And their conclusion was, that the worldwide effects of climate change are drastic 
and partly irreversible. And that is why we have to take action now, while we still can. We will have to do everything we can in order to pass on a viable world for coming generations. The Dutch government is already working hard towards such a world. And it has one clear goal in mind, namely to make the Netherlands climate neutral by the year 2050. And that is no easy feat, by any means, because there is a lot of work to be done, which requires a lot of capable hands. And there lies one of our challenges, namely finding enough technicians to help us with this energy transition so we can ultimately achieve our climate goals. And to tackle this problem, we have created the Technology Pact, a collaboration with educational institutions, employers and employees organizations and businesses to increase the number of technicians. And how, I hear you ask? Well, with retraining employees who don't have all the necessary skills for new climate jobs or who work in soon-to-be-extinct fossil jobs. And through this pact, we also improve the connection between our education system and our job market, which leads to more clever and capable students with a technical background who can do their part in slowing down climate change. And maybe some of those clever, capable and flexible minds are in this room today. Or they're watching online. And they can meet their British or Dutch counterparts live or through a screen. Because, as I said before, climate change affects us all. And that's why we have to work together and look beyond our own borders. Such as today with British and Dutch students present. I'm curious to see what you can accomplish if you listen to each other, inspire each other and think outside the box. Good luck, everyone. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Sander. If you were here, I uh, <laughs> would thank you in person, but he isn't, so I am hoping he will, uh, he will hear from us later. Um, but what he touches upon is very important. Today is uh, going to be a discussion really between not just the Netherlands, but also the UK. And that is why it's so exciting to announce the next part, where we're going to be discussing with both staff and students from here in the Netherlands and from the UK. So I'm going to announce my speakers, uh, and I hope they'll come into the room when I do so. <laughs> we'll start off with Dr. Uh, Ria Raya Dunkley, who will be joining us via Zoom on one of these screens. Uh, Dr. Dunkley is a senior lecturer in Geography, Environment and Sustainability at the University of Glasgow. Uh, our next panelist will be Tim van Hattem, who is the program leader uh, uh, Green Climate Solutions at the University of Wageningen, Wageningen University and Research. Uh, welcome, Tim. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Uh, <laughs> Our next speaker is Josh, Josh Tregill. He is a climate activist and coordinator for the Mock COP26. Welcome, Josh. <laughs> and last but not least, we'll have Tiffany, Tiffany Septier, who is the executive board member at Students for Tomorrow, or the Studenten voor Morgen, the Dutch NGO. <laughs> ah, perfect. And I see we have Ria here behind me. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me oh, okay? We don't hear you yet. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you loud and yes. clear. You can Great. hear us as well? Yes, yes. yes. Hi. <laughs> good, uh, good afternoon. Do you pronounce your first name as Ria or Raya? Uh, it's Ria, yes. Ria, yes. perfect. Yeah, yes. that's, that's how the Dutch do it as well. <laughs> Welcome yes. to you two, all the way from England. Where are you calling us from? Uh, I'm actually in Scotland, in, Scotland. Um, in Glasgow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you just you figured I'm going to go to Glasgow to really emerge myself from the COP26 uh, surroundings. <laughs> well, so uh, I'm from Glasgow, Glasgow right. University, and, and, and live near, nearby, but um, I'm originally from Wales. So, right. uh, yeah, I don't have the Scottish accent. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, we're very thankful to have you here, uh, even if it is through Zoom. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if I'm correct, you have prepared a, a presentation for us. Uh, can I give you the yeah. floor to do that for us? <laughs> yeah, yeah thank you very much. 
Okay, so um, I'm just going to say a little bit about what we're doing at the University of Glasgow um, in terms of this agenda on climate action. So there's intense positive energy in the university, both at the grassroots level amongst students and academics and the professional service staff too, um, as well as at the kind of higher levels of um, senior management groups. So um, there's been a sustainable working group established, which is co-chaired by the chief operating officer, um, David Duncan at the university, and also um, the Centre for Sustainable Solutions director, Professor Damien Tonu. So there's that really important kind of joined up working going on across uh, academics and specialists and the um, kind of infrastructure, uh, people who are central to this transition. Um, and that energy, of course, has only been elevated by our hosting of COP um, during, some, uh, during autumn last year. Um, so in terms of kind of what, what we're doing, the Sustainable Working Group hasn't currently um, required schools to undertake sustainability um, agendas through policy within individual schools. Um, but the group is leading initiatives um, in operational and academic realms working to make it easier for schools to adopt sustainable practices. Um, so an example of that would be that um, it's recently been developed a decision-making tool for sustainable business travel. So the University of Glasgow worked with our um, travel provider who organises kind of flights and accommodation and that side of things for the staff everyday travel. Um, to create a dashboard and reporting tool um, where you'll be able to see the carbon cost of different modes of travel at different points of um, booking the trip. So it's building that kind of reflective element, if you like, into um, decision making. Uh, another uh, example is the Centre for Sustainable Solutions um, is developing um, continuous professional development short courses for professional services and academic staff in the field of sustainability. And that's aimed at kind of enhancing understanding of the actions that we can all take to help us reach net zero by our target, which is 2030. Um, so everyone kind of needs to be part of that transition in such a kind of rapid time scale that we're working to there. Um, and then at the kind of more grassroots level, we've got a community of practice established at the university that's working to embed sustainability across the university within the curriculum, as well as kind of thinking about all of this as the other elements of learning and teaching that are perhaps more hidden within a university setting, but we all know are kind of embedded to our practice. Um, I also wanted to mention something about kind of how young people and students are central to these activities. So um, at the University of Glasgow, young people and students can get involved in um, climate action in, in a number of ways. So there's been a concerted efforts to have student representation on decision-making bodies, so from the court and senate to the sustainability working group. And we also have a more, again, sort of grassroots to begin with, but now deeply embedded within the university, uh, a, a group called GUEST, which stands for Glasgow University Environmental Sustainability Team. And they enact kind of sustainability initiatives across campus that can be on things like biodiversity, sustainable transport, and considering kind of food procurement choices and things like that. Um, and we've also had, again, even perhaps more at the grassroots and a more radical dimension, we had a group of students in the lead up to COP who established a Green New Deal um, proposal for the university. Uh, they created a manifesto of 60 demands, looking at things like the university infrastructure and the curriculum. And they're now working with us at the Centre for Sustainable Solutions to turn some of those demands into action. Um, and so I think sort of all of that is uh, kind of brilliant work in progress um, to, to start us off. Um, but also I wanted to kind of acknowledge that we don't forget um, children and, and very young people in this process. So in our research and engagement work, particularly in the School of Education where I'm built, um, based, We've worked on kind of research projects and within our teaching practices to embed sustainability. Uh, so 
for example, between sort of uh, 2018 and 2021, I was working on a European network um, project where we um, look to embed the sustainable development goals in teaching in secondary schools. And in my sort of every day, I teach primary school teachers about climate change and what um, what's known as eco-pedagogy to help to facilitate that cultural transition because that's kind of a crucial driver for me personally is to be in education so that we can have that um, kind of butterfly effect really where we're having an influence um, both immediately on our students but then by implementation to all of those young people that they're going to encounter um, through their lives too. Um, Another kind of recent exciting development that we have is we, we're developing a suite of future learning courses, so the kind of um, uh, MOOC setting, uh, to look at climate action within both educational contexts but also within um, the context of um, business and enterprise so that we can have even greater um, reach in terms of what we're doing. Um, so as I was asked also to, I'm running out of time, <laughs> I've just say a couple of things quickly about um we've we've um got some some plans in terms of our, our research projects that are coming up so we're about to embark on a big uh, project working with the people of Glasgow for the next five years um to kind of look at transition at the city uh, scale but perhaps I'll I'll leave it there I think <laughs> um if that's that's okay. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much for your for your talk. I think uh, it sounds like you spent every living minute working on climate change and sustainability, and it sounds like <laughs> so that con congratulations on that. I think that <laughs> I recognise that a lot, but um, uh, that's great to see, and uh, good to see that the University of Glasgow also has so many different uh, initiatives uh, to actually make sure that everyone at the university is is working uh, on on this issue. Um, I was actually wondering, Tim, do you recognise any of the the four formats that they've used maybe at, from something that Wageningen already does. Yeah, what I see uh, involving students in decisions that the university makes, uh, that's what we uh, we do as well at Wageningen University. And yeah. um, I think that's really important to, to get new ideas from young people. Um, uh, they're the future and we need them. So yeah. yeah. Great. No, I was really excited by that Green Deal idea. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if we can maybe afterwards share those 60 commands, because I'm, I'm looking, I mean, I'm interested to see how applicable they could be to, to the Dutch situation as well. Maybe Wageningen needs to write their own Green Deal as well. Well, plans are already in the making, uh, Ria. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I'm now going to pass the mic, or you already have the mic, on to Tim, uh, who's now going to give his perspective from Wageningen. So we've just heard the UK perspective, and now we go on to the Netherlands. Uh, you have a presentation with you. Uh, good yeah. luck. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is uh, Tim van Hattem. I am uh, the program leader of um, the Green Climate Solutions Program at Wageningen University and Research. Um, and I just want to take you a little bit into uh, the work we do. Um, well, this is, uh, this is our campus. Uh, we work there with uh, over 5,000 researchers and uh, 12,000 students on uh, the big issues of the world today. Uh, how are we going to feed uh, 10, 10 billion people? Um, well, uh, how do we deal with uh, loss of biodiversity? and of course also uh, climate change. And um, well, we are allowed to call us the most sustainable university in the world, uh, according to some, uh, some rankings, the, the green metric. Uh, we are of course very proud on that, and, and there's still uh, lots of um, uh, room for improvement. So uh, we are not there yet, but, uh, but we are doing quite, quite well. Uh, well, looking at climate change, of course, this is uh, a very huge topic. And, um, well, with a lot of uh, researchers, we are focusing on uh, solutions. Uh, we, we know what climate change is, we know the problem. Now we have to move forward, we have to accelerate climate action, and therefore we need evidence base about climate solutions. That's what we're looking at. Um, and at Wageningen, we have a real, uh, we have a system approach. Um, so we look at energy, of course, but climate change is much more than only the energy transition. Uh, food, for instance, eh? our whole food system is one third uh, causing climate change for one for 30 percent. So if we if we have this energy transition, uh, if it's totally done, we still have we ha we still have a climate problem because of our food system, and our food system is connected to to nature. 
um, well, we want to move toward, towards a bio-based economy that's connected to nature as well, also to food. Um, and climate change has a huge impact on, uh, on cities. So what we do is we try to understand the impact of climate change um, and we look for system approaches, system-wide solutions to, uh, well, to, to solve this problem. And um, yeah, this picture symbolizes a little bit the world today. Uh, you could say uh, the world is on fire. Um, well, and we are still playing a game of golf. Eh? Um, um, we, have, we are walking from uh, one crisis into another. Eh? We had COVID crisis, now we have Ukraine. Uh, well, maybe tomorrow we have another crisis. But we know that climate change is still moving forward. And we have to act. We have to do something. And uh, we, have, we live in a short-term world. Um, and we need a long-term perspective for, for dealing with this climate, uh, climate topic. Well, um, I heard the, the IPCC report was all already mentioned. Eh? The, 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 the topic was, the title was, we are, are in code red. Eh? We are in the danger zone. Well, everybody knows that. Um, I hope you all read the, the assessment report. Did, did uh, anybody read it? 6,000 pages. <laughs> well, I have a short summary for you. Um, well, I think it's quite clear. Eh? It's, it's warming. We know that. Uh, it's us. Eh? It's... Uh, we are causing it, um, we are sure about it. Um, it's bad, it's really bad, it's really concerning. But I think the, the, the most important message is we can fix it. Uh, we can still fix it if we start acting on a massive scale. And therefore we need a lot of young and inspiring people. But climate change is not the only problem. We are talking about climate change uh, a lot, but we are far less talking about this issue, and that is loss of biodiversity. And climate change and biodiversity are very much connected. They are really connected problems, and also the solutions are connected. So we need an integrated approach, and not just focusing on carbon, but focus on uh, how to create a sustainable world. And the answer is nature-based solutions. Um, there's a lot of focus on technical solutions, the energy transition, solar, wind, electric cars, and we need all of these, but we also need to invest much more in nature-based solutions. They are the best carbon stores, storage. Uh, they can help us reduce carbon uh, fr from the atmosphere, uh, store carbon, but also create resilience for the impact of climate change. And um, well, what we did with a, um, uh, with a group of people, if you, uh, if, you, if you ask people in the Netherlands, how do you think the Netherlands will look like in 100 years, then uh, all these messages about climate change, everybody's getting really, really concerned. We are getting scared. And uh, people think our country will be flooded because of sea level rise, of course. And we thought, can we make another story about how our country could look like in 100 years? a future vision, a long-term vision of the future of the Netherlands. So with a group of scientists at the campus in Wageningen, we developed a, a new map of our country, a nature-based map, a nature-based perspective on the future of our country. And, uh, well, this created a lot of hope and uh, inspiration for many people. We talked to ministries, to governments, to, to uh, municipalities, provinces, businesses, and everybody thought, okay, this is actually the way forward. We have to move towards this direction. And this creates a sense of, sense of hope, but also creates uh, a feeling of we have to act, we have to do something. Because our main message is uh, the future starts today. Uh, we have to start acting today, and we see our country uh, a little bit as a living lab for climate and biodiversity <laughs> solutions uh, for all over the world. But I think any country can be a living lab. And, well, that's my conclusion. <laughs> so, uh, we have to create this nature-based uh, future together with everybody, together with all of us. Uh, so, we, we created this vision for the Netherlands, but we have to create these visions for every country in the world and then uh, start doing it. And therefore, we need great ideas from young people. So I want to, uh, I hope you, you get inspired and start uh, thinking in this direction, thinking about the future we want uh, instead of the future we don't want. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for that presentation. I was wondering, Josh, we, earlier we talked about the fact that you were still looking for a master's program in uh, renewable energy. Has Tim convinced you to head to Wageningen now? I, all, of the, all of the research, I particularly love uh, maps that look pretty, and that, that one did look really pretty. <laughs> From your perspective, is it, is it very different how the UK approaches the, the climate problem and, and how the Netherlands does it? Um, I mean, this is the first time I've been in the Netherlands, so I can't, can't really go that much in depth, but the way that that's been approached, especially with the visual representation and then people getting behind it, I feel it is different. I think in the UK, um, it feels somewhat more siloed. Um, it, it sort of appears as a problem that renewable energy engineers or policy makers have to tackle. Yeah. And then the ordinary public, they don't need to be part of it, they just have to pay tax, I guess, and then fund some of it. So I think it, it's seen as a burden a lot of the time. I think th there's an issue of communication, trying to get across that actually it benefits all of us to take action on climate change, um, rather than it just being a burden that we have to somehow fund. Um, and, and I think that map is a really good way of showing that, and I, I really liked seeing it. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I really like the map as well. Um, <laughs> um, you brought some statements with you today, Josh, and, and so did you, Tiffany. Um, I'm looking at the audience right now as well, because we have what we call a VVOX. I hadn't heard of it as either, but uh, it's actually a website uh, that you can all log into to make sure that we hear your opinions as well. So if anyone, everyone could just grab their phones and log into the VVOX site, I hope we can show the, the password to that as well on the screen now. Um, I think it is just www vvox so that, that is v e v o x dot com yes there we go oh i was wrong it is vvox dot app <laughs> uh, and then you have the idea the id sorry uh, on the screen uh, and then we'll start off with an easy question that you sure all know the answer to uh, how are you feeling today um i'm just uh can, can, can I get some thumbs up from the audience? Is this working? Yes, I see some thumbs up and one thumb down. <laughs> if I see the first, uh, nice. That is at least one person that made it happen. And uh, that's two. Great, pretty good. Sunny, that's true. I was telling Josh that he shouldn't think that this is what the Netherlands looks like all the time. Uh, this week is extraordinarily sunny. Curious, that's good. A bit bored, and uh, we'll make that happen, then uh, we'll get a little bit more exciting. <laughs> Existentialist, ooh, that's deep. Okay, I think this definitely works. Uh, great to see that most of you are doing fine or great. Some of you great even with the exclamation mark at the end. <laughs> uh, but Josh, I want to give the mic uh, to you again, because you brought some statements that you want to discuss, or. Uh, first propose to the audience and then we'll discuss it with the group here as well. Yeah, so I think that based on this statement, um, higher education is a place that can have real impact when it comes to tackling climate change. Uh, universities bring together a, a really diverse range of people from all around the world, different parts of society, and then they go off into different industries, different countries, different workplaces. So if through the time of university, graduates learn to have a sustainable mindset and they leave with a sustainable mindset it like um, Ria was talking about earlier with the butterfly effect which I really like the phrase butterfly effect it takes that learning and that knowledge and that mindset to so many different places and it applies not just to businesses um, I, I found a statistic the other day that um, where is it uh, 57 world leaders uh, right now were educated in the UK um, and the same applies to lots of universities across Europe. Um, people come from so many different countries, they learn their degrees, they get a, a graduate, they go on a graduate program and then they go off, they become politicians, they become influential figures and if universities give that mindset it doesn't only change the way that businesses think but how politicians also think. Um, I think a statistic that really highlights that is one that UNESCO uh, found. I can't remember what year this was, but it was that only 3% of people attend university, but 80% of leadership positions are taken by people in university. So university is a, is a really great place to target making leaders more sustainable, 
um, board meetings and politicians. I think one of the other things, it was a quote that I really liked um, from Jonathan Porritt, and he said, universities should prepare students for the, world, the work of the world, not just the world of work. And the way that instead of going through university to get a job or to, to do dot, 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 you should be going through university to actually have an impact on the world through doing work. Um, and I think that's a really nice way to sort of summarize the whole thing. Great, thank you. I mean, I think your speech was, was well done because you've convinced most of the audience. Um, <laughs> there are some people who do not agree, but most of them uh, definitely agree. Um, is there by any chance someone who didn't agree that would like to, to add why they didn't? No shame whatsoever. Yes, we have someone here in the front. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself here quickly? Yes, you? my name is uh, Fons Jansen. I live here in the Netherlands. I also studied in Wageningen and uh, I'm right now the Dutch coordinator of the European Climate Pact, the social program of the European Green Deal in the member states. I did not agree because I want all education facilities uh, to instill a sustainable mindset. Mm. Because most of the things that were mentioned with the engineers also pra practical and so far as I see it with my other countries is that especially vocational work sometimes is ahead but not but good with the technology but not with the sustainable mindset while I see in in the HBO applied sciences and sciences we are already going well ahead but I see this big divide in society that these education levels also in the green education from agriculture and food is not connected at all and that really worries me yeah no, fair, fair point. So we agree with the statement, but we do think that it shouldn't be just higher education. Uh, what do you think about that, uh, Josh? Yeah, I fully agree. I also think it should start earlier. I think secondary school and primary school, the whole of the education system should prepare people for this. Um, I, in the UK especially, there's a massive disconnect between people's understanding of climate change, the climate crisis, particularly what they can do to be part of the solution. It feels like a very hopeless thing. You, you see all of these statistics, and they don't look good. But actually, there's so much, like, like you've been saying, so much positive stuff that we could do to make it better. And people just don't realize. So I think starting in all aspects of education, so not only people who are privileged enough to get into higher education or to, to be able to do that sort of thing, are able to have that experience. It should start younger and it should be across all types of education. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Tim, do you, uh, at Wageningen, do you have, already have a world leader program? Not as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we should start that soon then. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of ideas. Yeah. Um, I want to go to the next uh, statement that Josh brought with him. Um, yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So I think this one sort of links to not what you learn, but what you see. And I think that the environment that you, you grow up in, the environment that you go through education can have a real impact on the way that you see a good example of something. So universities are quite often good at doing climate research. Uh, the university I'm at, for example, has a climate institute and they produce good climate reports. But there's, there's a disconnect between their research and then how that gets put into courses that they do. It feels very much siloed. And I think that by creating a, an environment that just promotes sustainability, and they've, they overtly do sustainable things, would be a really good way to change, I guess linking back to that mindset, what people normalize as being a good or a bad thing. Um, if, for example, you go to a university and they've got solar panels or they do a responsible agriculture, uh, universities own a lot of land. So if universities, when they rent farmland, had a clause in it that said you must do sustainable agricultural practices, those sorts of examples could have a real impact on the way that people normalize what good and bad looks like when they go off to maybe be world leaders or go into business or industry or get a job. If the company or place that they're working doesn't do those sorts of things, it, it can create that conflict of, well, this is what I've been used to whilst I've been at university or whilst I've been going through education. I've seen all of these good examples, but this place doesn't do it. I feel like that could also be quite a good way to create that butterfly effect for people to start questioning things that they see that aren't matching up to their expectations from how they've managed to get them through university and education. Okay, perfect. So if I understand you correctly, uh, kind of we have to portray more what kind of climate research we're doing and actually make it practic practical, not just for the students that are studying sustainability, but for all students. Yes, yeah, so instead of it being 
uh, mentioned maybe in an optional module or something that's not for right. credit if it gets incorporated into different modules. Um, so there's that underlying sustainable mindset and people are used to thinking about things from a sustainability point of view rather yeah. than it being, I guess, like hiding it in plain sight rather than sticking it as an option that not many people are going to want to do because it's not for credit. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Again, uh, good pitch. Uh, you've agreed the majority. Uh, you're, you're, you've convinced the majority. A lot of maybes, though. I, I do wonder uh, why there's a maybe. Uh, anyone from the audience that would like to elaborate? Yeah, here at the front again. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm also a student at the moment in the Netherlands, but I have been in the UK as well. Um, so I, I really liked your pitch, and I definitely love to see it in my education. But uh, I also have a couple of friends who they care very much about climate change, but they very much want to leave it to other people. So mm -hmm. sometimes I think if we force climate change on everyone, if we really instill it into the very like culture of every educational institution, we're going to be turning some people away from climate from taking the adequate steps that we want them to be taking. Uh, so what do you think about that? Um, I think it is a very good point. Um, if you almost preach something to people, uh, that, that does create conflict and people want to try and oppose that sometimes. But I think that by the university becoming a, a role model example, they might not necessarily overtly be taught it. They might just be in an environment that thinks about sustainability or, or makes people raise questions about it. So they sort of covertly end up learning it through just being in an environment that is sustainable um, and that way it, it sort of they hopefully wouldn't feel preached to it, might, it would just happen uh, they might then notice when things are unsustainable rather than necessarily be constantly pushing for things to be more sustainable but it would have the same effect of if you bring up the, the least sustainable parts to be more sustainable it's the same as pushing the average up a bit yeah, I, I mean, I think this is definitely something that we can at least try and kind of see what the effect uh, would be. Thank you so much for your statements, uh, Josh. We're now heading on to Tiffany. Tiffany, you're, uh, as I already said, an executive board member at Students for Tomorrow, or Students for Morche. And at, in that board, uh, you're specifically responsible for sustainable education. So thank you so much for joining our panel. And you've also brought two statements. Uh, could you elaborate? Uh, yes, so it's, thank you, Anik. I'm really glad to be here. And I think the first statement kind of builds into um, the one Josh just introduced. So in the Netherlands, we have a university, so Altbout University, that uh, made it mandatory for sustainability to be addressed in every course that they're offering. Um, and that went from law to microbiology to any course, actually. Um, and this has been very controversial because it is true that sustainability is part of our lives. And if we are creating the leaders of tomorrow, which we want to do by making them attend higher education institutions, we should make them familiar um, with sustainability. But the question really is, is this the path to follow? Should we make every course related to sustainability and just try to work it in, in the hope that there is a way for them to coexist? Or should we give students the choice to decide, I am interested in sustainability and this is a track I wish to follow, so I'm going to take electives, I'm going to join an organization next to my academics. Um, and yes, I'm very interested to know what the general opinion about this is. Nice. What would, you, uh, what would, what would your opinion be as we kind of wait for, for the votes to come in? Uh, my personal opinion is that it should be integrated. Um, and I say this because <coughs> fundamentally, um, <coughs> curbing climate change is related to every academic field. So even if we talk about microbiology or even sciences and we're wondering how does it fit into such a specific science, these scientists are going to be the people who are going to be conducting research in 10 years. And it's unrealistic to think that they're not going to be faced with problems that are not related to sustainability. Um, and I feel like introducing it to them and then leaving them the choice to do whatever they want with that information. But at least that they have the grounds and the basics to be able to use that and hopefully we can also get them interested because this is um, a challenge that we can only solve if everybody works together. And this is why I really think it's important that it is addressed in all classes. Yeah, yeah, great to, great to hear. Um, as, as, as before, you've already convinced a lot of the people in the audience that it should be uh, better integrated. I'm actually wondering, is Ria still here? Because I'd love to hear her perspective on this as well. 
Um, but I don't know if she's. Hi. Yeah. Can you see me? <laughs> oh, yeah. You're behind oh. me. Actually, I have to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> Ria, I, I don't know if you've you've been able to you've been able to follow uh, uh, Tiffany's story. But how do you see this? How do you uh, do you see this as a viable option for the University of Glasgow? This integrated yeah, way. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think Tiffany's kind of um, opinion of my mind echoes her very much in terms of um, that it, it can and needs to be integrated. So if we accept that we're living in a climate emergency and we need a rapid transition of our society away from fossil fuels, that's going to involve a large cultural shift in terms of um, you know, our, our lifestyles and our ways of being alongside the ways we do business um, and the ways we educate children. So it, it can fit in with every course and um, that's because we need everybody kind of on hand so we need statisticians we need social scientists we need planners we need geographers um, you know alongside the climate scientists um, so to, to give an example of that um, our the project I mentioned Gallant which um, is going to run for the next five years in Glasgow and look to create the, the sustainable transition We've actually got 30 different academics from across the university working on that project. A lot of us for the first time collaborating to kind of tackle issues like, um, you know, thinking about biodiversity and nature-based solutions, whilst also thinking about, say, sustainable travel um, and, you know, getting around Glasgow on, on a bike and that sort of thing. So I think everybody can have a role in it. It's up to us as lecturers to kind of um, interact with this subject is to think about well how do we create an educational approach that fits for the 21st century yeah great i completely agree as well uh, we'll need everyone so we need to educate not just our youth but people from all ages to help out in the climate crisis uh, thank you ria uh, we'll head on to the to the next and last statement by tiffany uh yes so this last statement um came to me because i had a very long discussion with some other friends of mine who are very involved in um, in climate change and how to tackle that. And there's this question of when we talk about higher education, increasing investments in higher education because it's the key to creating leaders of tomorrow who are ultimately going to solve climate change. Um, this investment is going to be worthwhile in 10 years, five years. These people need to follow education, need to be educated, then they probably need a few years of practice, get to know what the difference between the theory and the practices before they can actually make an impact. And the question is, should we be focusing all the money that we have on further integrating sustainability in higher education, or should there be more money distributed towards research or um, student organizations, for example, who are striving to make change and can probably make change on the shorter term, and is that where the money should be going to? Interesting. Do you see that as an or? Or? Is it like an either or? Or could it be both as well? I wish it was both. But if we look at policy making, um, one of the main challenges is money allocation. We see that when you ask for grants um, from different ministries, they're always like, yes, we want to allocate this, but they're putting projects in competition and there only is a certain amount of money that can be allocated. And so I do think that we're going to need to make um, a choice. And it's very unfortunate because I do think that both are essential. Yeah. Um, but for me, and maybe the audience disagrees with this, but I do think that at the moment with the current status quo, it is an or question. Yeah. No, I'm interested to see in the fact that the, the audience is mostly either in doubt, so maybe, or, but mo a lot of them actually say no as well. So could anyone uh, elaborate on that? Why do you not think that we should invest in these higher education in initiatives? And, and what is the best way to spend our money then? Anyone? Yeah, here? Oh, wait, one second for the microphone. Yeah. I don't think that uh, higher education needs much more money because we already have a lot of money in the higher education institutions. Maybe for research we need more money, but uh, for the, uh, making better programs there is a lot of money. And, uh, so better invest on uh, other things that are more short term that are uh, research than just on 
the education programs themselves. It's a quality cycle, and they should be uh, re, uh, uh, yeah, uh, they should come better already, and they should take it up already. So. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, um, I was going to ask you anyway. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, maybe maybe to react on that because I agree. If, if more money, uh, we always talk about more money. Because I think that there's, there's money enough. Uh, the, the money is not the problem. We need to to focus, uh, address the right problems. And and we have been studying uh, climate change uh, for a long while, and uh, but now it's really time for action. So we need other other type of research. We need more action based research mm -hmm. that that really leads to um, and that that's not only um, understanding uh, what is the best solar panel, yeah. but it's all, uh, especially it is how to accelerate the uptake of uh, all these solar panels right. uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, <coughs> this, and, and society still doesn't understand the transitions we, we need to uh, stay below this one and a half degree. Mm -hmm. We need to change our energy, energy systems, our food system, our, our relation with nature, our, our uh, building other cities in another way. We have to do everything we do in a different way. And that we need so many uh, experts on that, how to do that, but also people that can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, um, and their education has a real important role, I think. Okay. Okay, I'm. Uh, I'm gonna just thank you because we've already uh, talked way too, uh, way, for way too long. Uh, <laughs> but it's very interesting, and I'm, I'm very sure that people in the audience are, are definitely not done with you yet. You'll ba you'll come back in in, in part two as well. Uh, but you will get the chance to talk to these people uh, during our networking break. So that is very exciting. Uh, so get ready to be bombarded with questions. Um, but I think we ended on a really nice note here because we talked a little bit just now about kind of the link between higher education and action and I think that is uh, where policymakers actually play a really big role and that is what we're going to talk about in the second part so in the second part we'll talk to about uh, talk to two policymakers from the Dutch uh, government uh, I'm very excited to talk to them you'll get to uh, speak pitch in during that discussion as well uh, but for now I'm gonna uh, tell you uh, <laughs> or guide you to the bar uh, and you'll get to have a drink uh, talk to each other for about half an hour and then we'll come back at 315 uh, to start with part two. Thank you very much. The climate emergency is here. That is undisputable. But just how much are we doing about it? British Council recently conducted a research with 8,000 young people. It revealed that 75% of young people around the world have skills to deal with climate change in their communities. But only 31% have participated in climate action. Across 23 countries, 67% of young people feel that leaders cannot address climate change alone. The news is not good. Every statistic, everything we run into, shows us that there are big, big problems that are happening now, and those big problems will cause more problems. And we should have acted 30 years ago. We should have acted 20 years ago. But if we weren't acting 30 years ago, and we weren't acting 20 years ago, the best time to act is now. Our work in arts, education and English creates opportunities for young people from across the UK and the world to come together for the planet. We need different voices so we can find new answers. Together we can create, collaborate and connect to tackle the climate emergency. We have partnered with Fashion Open Studio to use fashion to engage the public in a global dialogue on climate change to help raise awareness of how the fashion industry can be part of the solution. Our 17 creative commissions bring together diverse groups across 35 countries to create innovative responses through art, science and digital technology. People just need to take ownership of the climate and being involved in the creative process will give you that. We all just need to work together and it can be done. Working with English language teaching organisations around the world, 
we are supporting teachers to integrate environment issues into language teaching. We have partnered with the Association of Commonwealth Universities to mentor and support 26 rising star researchers from 16 countries through the Commonwealth Futures Climate Research Cohort Program to help them translate multidisciplinary knowledge into solutions for communities most affected by climate change. Engaging in a global network enables the sharing of knowledge and expertise, connecting the UK and other countries. We need to do this so that everyone can contribute to a better future. Our roundtables connect policymakers and academics to evidence and approaches that can shape our future. And making that knowledge accessible to as many people as possible is crucial. FameLab inspires young scientists passionate about climate change to connect to a new audience. This year's competition gives them the chance to bust climate science myths and provides them with a stage to communicate their ideas internationally. Future News Worldwide is a collaboration between British Council and some of the world's leading media organisations. We have given 23 young journalists in 22 countries professional development and support so that they can share accurate and engaging stories of climate change solutions generated by and for their local communities. People are the key, youth are the key, but only if they're empowered and have the platforms for their voices to be heard, then we do have a fighting chance against climate change. The British Council is supporting the UK's ambition to make COP26 the most inclusive ever. We're bringing diverse voices together from across the world to tackle the climate emergency. We're reaching beyond the usual climate change circles to strengthen cooperation through the arts, education and the English language. And we're giving young people a platform to come together and discover, share and act and build a better future for our planet. The climate emergency is here. That is undisputable. But just how much are we doing about it? British Council recently conducted a research with 8,000 young people. It revealed that 75% of young people around the world have skills to deal with climate change in their communities. But only 31% have participated in climate action. Across 23 countries, 67% of young people feel that leaders cannot address climate change alone. The news is not good. Every statistic, everything we run into, shows us that there are big, big problems that are happening now, and those big problems will cause more problems. And we should have acted 30 years ago. We should have acted 20 years ago. But if we weren't acting 30 years ago, and we weren't acting 20 years ago, the best time to act is now. Our work in arts, education, and English creates opportunities for young people from across the UK and the world to come together for the planet. We need different voices so we can find new answers. Together, we can create, collaborate, and connect to tackle the climate emergency. We have partnered with Fashion Open Studio to use fashion to engage the public in a global dialogue on climate change to help raise awareness of how the fashion industry can be part of the solution. Our 17 creative commissions bring together diverse groups across 35 countries to create innovative responses through art, science and digital technology. People just need to take ownership of the climate and being involved in the creative process will give you that. We all just need to work together and it can be done. Working with English language teaching organisations around the world we are supporting teachers to integrate environment issues into language teaching. 
We have partnered with the Association of Commonwealth Universities to mentor and support 26 rising star researchers from 16 countries through the Commonwealth Futures Climate Research Cohort Program to help them translate multidisciplinary knowledge into solutions for communities most affected by climate change. Engaging in a global network enables the sharing of knowledge and expertise, connecting the UK and other countries. We need to do this so that everyone can contribute to a better future. Our roundtables connect policymakers and academics to evidence and approaches that can shape our future. And making that knowledge accessible to as many people as possible is crucial. FameLab inspires young scientists passionate about climate change to connect to a new audience. This year's competition gives them the chance to bust climate science myths and provides them with a stage to communicate their ideas internationally. Future News Worldwide is a collaboration between British Council and some of the world's leading media organisations. We have given 23 young journalists in 22 countries professional development and support so that they can share accurate and engaging stories of climate change solutions generated by and for their local communities. People are the key, youth are the key, but only if they're empowered and have the platforms for their voices to be heard, then we do have a fighting chance against climate change. The British Council is supporting the UK's ambition to make COP26 the most inclusive ever. We're bringing diverse voices together from across the world to tackle the climate emergency. We're reaching beyond the usual climate change circles to strengthen cooperation through the arts, education and the English language. And we're giving young people a platform to come together and discover, share and act and build a better future for our planet. The climate emergency is here. That is undisputable. But just how much are we doing about it? British Council recently conducted a research with 8,000 young people. It revealed that 75% of young people around the world have skills to deal with climate change in their communities. But only 31% have participated in climate action. Across 23 countries, 67% of young people feel that leaders cannot address climate change alone. The news is not good. Every statistic, everything we run into, shows us that there are big, big problems that are happening now, and those big problems will cause more problems. And we should have acted 30 years ago. We should have acted 20 years ago. But if we weren't acting 30 years ago and we weren't acting 20 years ago, the best time to act is now. Our work in arts, education and English creates opportunities for young people from across the UK and the world to come together for the planet. We need different voices so we can find new answers. Together, we can create, collaborate and connect to tackle the climate emergency. We have partnered with Fashion Open Studio to use fashion to engage the public in a global dialogue on climate change to help raise awareness of how the fashion industry can be part of the solution. Our 17 creative commissions bring together diverse groups across 35 countries to create innovative responses through art, science and digital technology. People just need to take ownership of the climate and being involved in the creative process will give you that. We all just need to work together and it can be done. Working with English language teaching organisations around the world we are supporting teachers to integrate environment issues into language teaching. We have partnered with the Association of Commonwealth Universities to mentor and support 
26 rising star researchers from 16 countries through the Commonwealth Futures Climate Research Cohort Program to help them translate multidisciplinary knowledge into solutions for communities most affected by climate change. Engaging in a global network enables the sharing of knowledge and expertise, connecting the UK and other countries. We need to do this so that everyone can contribute to a better future. Our roundtables connect policymakers and academics to evidence and approaches that can shape our future. And making that knowledge accessible to as many people as possible is crucial. FameLab inspires young scientists passionate about climate change to connect to a new audience. This year's competition gives them the chance to bust climate science myths and provides them with a stage to communicate their ideas internationally. Future News Worldwide is a collaboration between British Council and some of the world's leading media organisations. We have given 23 young journalists in 22 countries professional development and support so that they can share accurate and engaging stories of climate change solutions generated by and for their local communities. People are the key, youth are the key, but only if they're empowered and have the platforms for their voices to be heard, then we do have a fighting chance against climate change. The British Council is supporting the UK's ambition to make COP26 the most inclusive ever. We're bringing diverse voices together from across the world to tackle the climate emergency. We're reaching beyond the usual climate change circles to strengthen cooperation through the arts, education and the English language. And we're giving young people a platform to come together and discover, share and act and build a better future for our planet. The climate emergency is here. That is undisputable. But just how much are we doing about it? British Council recently conducted a research with 8,000 young people. It revealed that 75% of young people around the world have skills to deal with climate change in their communities. But only 31% have participated in climate action. Across 23 countries, 67% of young people feel that leaders cannot address climate change alone. The news is not good. Every statistic, everything we run into, shows us that there are big, big problems that are happening now, and those big problems will cause more problems. And we should have acted 30 years ago. We should have acted 20 years ago. But if we weren't acting 30 years ago and we weren't acting 20 years ago, the best time to act is now. Our work in arts, education and English creates opportunities for young people from across the UK and the world to come together for the planet. We need different voices so we can find new answers. Together, we can create, collaborate and connect to tackle the climate emergency. We have partnered with Fashion Open Studio to use fashion to engage the public in a global dialogue on climate change to help raise awareness of how the fashion industry can be part of the solution. Our 17 creative commissions bring together diverse groups across 35 countries to create innovative responses through art, science and digital technology. People just need to take ownership of the climate and being involved in the creative process will give you that. We all just need to work together and it can be done. Working with English language teaching organisations around the world we are supporting teachers to integrate environment issues into language teaching. We have partnered with the Association of Commonwealth Universities to mentor and support 26 rising star researchers from 16 countries through the Commonwealth Futures Climate Research Cohort Programme.
to help them translate multidisciplinary knowledge into solutions for communities most affected by climate change. Engaging in a global network enables the sharing of knowledge and expertise, connecting the UK and other countries. We need to do this so that everyone can contribute to a better future. Our roundtables connect policymakers and academics to evidence and approaches that can shape our future. And making that knowledge accessible to as many people as possible is crucial. FameLab inspires young scientists passionate about climate change to connect to a new audience. This year's competition gives them the chance to bust climate science myths and provides them with a stage to communicate their ideas internationally. Future News Worldwide is a collaboration between British Council and some of the world's leading media organisations. We have given 23 young journalists in 22 countries professional development and support so that they can share accurate and engaging stories of climate change solutions generated by and for their local communities. People are the key, youth are the key, but only if they're empowered and have the platforms for their voices to be heard, then we do have a fighting chance against climate change. The British Council is supporting the UK's ambition to make COP26 the most inclusive ever. We're bringing diverse voices together from across the world to tackle the climate emergency. We're reaching beyond the usual climate change circles to strengthen cooperation through the arts, education and the English language. And we're giving young people a platform to come together and discover, share and act and build a better future for our planet. The climate emergency is here. That is undisputable. But just how much are we doing about it? British Council recently conducted a research with 8,000 young people. It revealed that 75% of young people around the world have skills to deal with climate change in their communities. But only 31% have participated in climate action. Across 23 countries, 67% of young people feel that leaders cannot address climate change alone. The news is not good. Every statistic, everything we run into, shows us that there are big, big problems that are happening now, and those big problems will cause more problems. And we should have acted 30 years ago. We should have acted 20 years ago. But if we weren't acting 30 years ago, and we weren't acting 20 years ago, the best time to act is now. Our work in arts, education and English creates opportunities for young people from across the UK and the world to come together for the planet. We need different voices so we can find new answers. Together, we can create, collaborate and connect to tackle the climate emergency. We have partnered with Fashion Open Studio to use fashion to engage the public in a global dialogue on climate change to help raise awareness of how the fashion industry can be part of the solution. Our 17 creative commissions bring together diverse groups across 35 countries to create innovative responses through art, science and digital technology. People just need to take ownership of the climate and being involved in the creative process will give you that. We all just need to work together and it can be done. Working with English language teaching organisations around the world, we are supporting teachers to integrate environment issues into language teaching. We have partnered with the Association of Commonwealth Universities to mentor and support 26 rising star researchers from 16 countries through the Commonwealth Futures Climate Research Cohort Programme to help them translate multidisciplinary knowledge into solutions for communities most affected by climate change. 
Engaging in a global network enables the sharing of knowledge and expertise, connecting the UK and other countries. We need to do this so that everyone can contribute to a better future. Our roundtables connect policymakers and academics to evidence and approaches that can shape our future. And making that knowledge accessible to as many people as possible is crucial. FameLab inspires young scientists passionate about climate change to connect to a new audience. This year's competition gives them the chance to bust climate science myths and provides them with a stage uh, to communicate their Thank you everyone, welcome back to part two of this event. Uh, I hope you all find your way back from the bar to here and have your beverages here and uh, replenished for the, for the next round. Uh, I hope you all found the first round interesting. Uh, we got a chance to talk to students and staff from universities and as I said at the end of the last round, uh, the second part will be about the link between those higher education in institutions and our policy makers here in the Netherlands. Um, and we also have a member from, in the panel from abroad. Uh, I'm just going to introduce our panel really quickly. Uh, we have the members from the previous panel, but new on the stage are René van Hel, who is the Director Inclusive Green Growth at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we have Sophie de Witt, who is a Youth Policy Officer, also at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And online, we should have Juja Mamri, uh, if you're here. It's always exciting to see if that works or not. <laughs> I see something happening, but I don't know if... She oh, yes. Can you hear us, uh, Juja? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Loud and clear. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> also, a question to you. Where are you coming uh, from? Uh, I'm calling in from Nairobi, Kenya, um, wow. but very, very sad that I can't be there with you and enjoy the beverages and networking. <laughs> yeah, you're truly missing out. Uh, <laughs> are you in Nairobi for the UNEP uh, uh, event or just for work? I'm not, no, oh. but I should go and gate crash. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you should. Well, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Juja uh, Mamri, who is the Director of Climate Philanthropy at Impatience Earth and uh, a UK delegate for the G7 Youth Summit. Maybe very quickly, Juja, what does Impatience Earth do? Uh, so we are a climate philanthropy consultancy. So we work with philanthropists and donors who've never given to the climate space before to start giving um, to climate solutions because just 2% of global philanthropic giving currently goes to climate solutions. Yeah, wow. And do you, when you speak with these kind of corporations or, or individuals, do you, do you notice that they have, do they have some clue of what, what direction to go into or do you really need to guide them uh, completely? Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Thankfully, so far, I haven't come across anybody who has denied the fact that we are living through a climate crisis. So everyone's pretty on board that something needs to be done. I think um, most of the donors that we work with just feel actually quite overwhelmed by all the different areas that they could potentially put their money into because there are so many different types of climate solutions that exist. So for them, it's really about helping them figure out where they can fund best and with most impact. Yeah, uh, I can imagine. Uh, I, I mean, I think everyone in this panel can can understand in somewhat uh, what in, indeed sometimes a jungle it is of climate change where there's so many things going on and the climate crisis has so many different dimensions and perspectives. So uh, good to see that you're, you're acting as a guide for, for investors in that sense. Uh, and thank you for joining the panel. Uh, we're going to start off with some... Uh, uh, statements here with uh, Renee and uh, Sophie but uh, if you want to pitch in definitely do just raise your hand or just barge in uh, I don't think anyone here minds <laughs> if you do uh, and same goes for the other panelists of course uh, so uh, you can already see it on the screen but here in the Netherlands uh, we have a national climate agreement and a coalition agreement since a couple of months that e goes even further with their climate ambitions um, what role do you think uh, the Dutch higher education se sector has in delivering these targets and do you feel like the higher education sector is taking those targets seriously enough? 
such easy questions. No, yeah. <laughs> let, let me first say, I'm, you know, I, I believe in academic freedom, so, so I'm not going to criticize the academia, but I think if I look at my own organization and how much work we still have to do to mainstream sustainability and climate, climate conscious policies, then I think that probably also mirrors a little bit what the challenges are for the, for the academia. And yes, they have to, to play an important role because of the 80% and 3% that he just mentioned, the statistics. So yeah, that's definitely the case. I, I was a student in the 80s. I studied economics and then already we spoke about externalizing the, inter, uh, internalizing the external effects of economic growth. Um, so so we, we know what it's about, but we also have to sort of look at it in, at a more integrated manner. Mm -hmm. it's, not about, it's not about religion, it's not about wokeism, it's not about identity, it's about facts, it's about science. And since it is about facts and science, it needs to be integrated, an integral part of, of, of the curricula of universities and studies. That's, that's what I would think. Hmm. Yeah, and right. then it can be very helpful for the very reasons that were already laid out by the previous speakers. Yeah, and is it because you mentioned the eighty, the eighty-three percent, the eighty and the three percent, obviously that Josh mentioned earlier? Is that you think the the main reason why higher education should invest in sustainability, or what? No, 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 because uh, economics speak, speak, but we 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 need human capital with, with green skills. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely, and, and, and not only at the academia, but we, we need it on, on all layers of, 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 of education. Mm -hmm. yes. And from your perspective, do you, do you see that higher education is taking those targets seriously enough? I, 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 from, from my perspective, we cannot go fast enough <laughs> because I've been working on these issues for the last 30 years. Uh, I, w I was an intern at the European Parliament and we were working on the, 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 the Earth Summit in 1992. So we, we know what is at stake and we, we, need, we need to move faster. And I think that uh, well-educated students, like from Wageningen, but I see that also uh, Leiden and Groningen are in the top 10 of, the, 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 of your beautiful matrix. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're probably well equipped to, 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 to do the smart things, but, even, but, 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 but my impression is that even if the university in itself is not so much focused on it, I'm, surpri I'm, I'm not surprised, but I'm really encouraged by how many young people, just whether, whatever they have done to university or vocational training, are really motivated to work on this issue. Right. Um, what, what is your perspective on that, Sophie? Because you're a youth officer right now at Foreign Affairs, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but you're also a student. Uh, can you maybe, first of all, tell, tell a little bit about that, how that yeah, works? Definitely. So, um, I'm a youth officer. I just started a month ago at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but besides that, I'm actually doing a dual program. So, um, I'm working four days a week and I'm studying one day a week at the Radboud University. Um, so, they're trying to combine theory and practice to not only after finishing your master degree working very academically throw you into the professional field but also reflect a bit more on the academic side of the work so i'm still with one foot in the academic world with the other foot into the ministry of foreign affairs um, but when i look back at my own academic background i studied international relations which is then very much related to what i'm doing right now actually you know international diplomacy international relations but when i look back at my bachelor's degree there was not one course on on climate change not one course on sustainability we learned about law about um, history about political science um, economics but not about climate so i find that very interesting because right now i'm working in the inclusive green growth department in the climate team, but in my bachelor, I didn't even learn about these topics. So I think there is a, a very far way to go where we can improve in education. But of course, we're on the right track. Wageningen is doing a lot. Um, Radboud University as well. But um, yeah, we can still improve. Yeah, I can imagine, Rene, for you as well, as the director of the Inclusive Gr Green Growth Directory. Um, you obviously get a lot of young people uh, in your team that want to contribute. Uh, to, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the work that you, you're doing there. Do you see that, that there's kind of a discrepancy of what uh, young, peop or young people want to do in climate change and kind of what they've been able to, t to yeah, learn in their, in their schooling? I, I don't see, I, at, my, at my ministry, I don't see a, a skill gap. Okay. Uh, because, because what we're doing is pretty applied. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we're, we're trying to create frameworks and we're trying to, to, to start projects. Uh, international frameworks like, 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 like we negotiate at the COP or, or very concrete projects uh, to m promote sustainable energy uh, in, in, in Mali. 
um, so, so this is kind of applied. But what, 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 but what I do see is um, that the need also at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to have specialists. Mm -hmm. So, so whoever is it, whoever ever heard of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we're not only diplomats who speak at a very sort of ethereal uh, a, a level about things, but we also really need specialists who yeah. know something about food security, who knows something about water engineering, because those people are also very much warranted. Right. And of course, and then it's ha ha nice if they know, know to make the, ma the ne make the nexus. Of course, we're at the Ministry of, what, what I also find interesting at the Ministry, sorry for saying this, but there's a war going on in the Ukraine. And of course, what we see is that the national security threat that we now all feel about making this energy transition is hopefully more of a motor than a potential clim climate catastrophe. So, but it's, it's, it, it takes a lot of stewardship and, 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 we, and not only by the government, but also by, by citizens. They need to feel this, they need to feel that it's urgent. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so right. that's, that's what we're working on. Yeah, I think what, you, what you're kind of describing is the fact that we're still maybe very reliant on external factors uh, on uh, when you look at the kind of the, uh, the way that people think about the climate crisis. And in, in, indeed, if something external happens, uh, such as one of these crises, then uh, all of a sudden it's very important to, to, to accelerate the, the energy transition. But obviously it would be better if we didn't need those factors. Do you then see there a, ro a role for higher education? Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, but but I, I think it's an, an, a transition is, is economics, is the knowledge, but is it is also the politics. So, and it's also how you, how you bring the news across and how, how you frame it. Um, so we, we really need, we also need students who, who have studied communication because they also know um, what social media can do and cannot do and what, what framing means and what algorithms means when, when you want to discuss the facts and when they get sometimes conflated or pushed into some, 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 some silly woke, woke pie in the sky uh, 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 kind of uh, thing, which it is not. Mm, right, yeah. Is it something that you recognize, Sophie, as, or is there something concrete that you might have, that you missed during your studies, or still miss? Um, Maybe something that... It's easier for you to say than for me, so yeah. <laughs> feel free. <laughs> to be honest, I don't feel as such that I missed something. I, I studied a lot, and I actually want to to work now and put my knowledge into action. I think you can study for a long time, and I did mm -hmm. until now. I'm 26 years old. I studied for 26 years old. So I'm, I'm ready to, to put that into practice, and um, I'm continuing to learn, and I think um, maybe also contributing to this uh, notion of crisis, I think um, that's also a, a big role for universities. You know, they do research. We already talked about the IPCC report that just came out last week. And researchers can uh, put a lot of pressures also on government um, to, to feel the urgency of the climate crisis. The, the last report stated that the window of opportunity for us as humans to adapt to climate change is getting smaller and smaller. And um, also in our team, we can use that to show the urgency also to um, to our colleagues like this is a this is a crisis and we should act now and I think so it's not only universities that create awareness in young people and educate them to to um, solve climate change but also right now show the urgency of of the climate crisis right yeah perfect I, I'm wondering maybe a, a statement for the for the panel to discuss amongst themselves uh, how big do you think the role of policymakers should be in maybe I'm saying forcing higher education institutions to to really uh, have all of these classes on sustainability and make sure that all of their students are ready to face all of these different crises and, and actually help solve them in their work uh, I'm wondering also the, the three other panelists what their what their opinion is on that Maybe Tim? Yeah, I think um, if I look at Wageningen, uh, sustainability and uh, green thinking is in the DNA of most people and also in the DNA of the whole organization. Um, but but um, for, for, for a lot of institutes, uh, for, for especially uh, for instance for economic students, um, there is a total mind shift uh, needed to, to move in the, in the right direction. So I think it would help if policymakers um, would force um, higher education to do that. 
Um, but on the other hand, um, higher education should also force policymakers to do their own thing in the right direction. Right. But there's also a lot of uh, mission work to be done. Yeah, and yeah. Tiffany, it kind of uh, goes on, kind of fits with your, the statement that you presented earlier. What's your opinion on this? I think it's more of a tickle down. I think if policymakers start caring more about the environment, then it is going to tickle down because there is a desire specifically from students um, to learn more about how to solve climate change, to learn more about the climate in general, and to work towards solutions. Um, I am wondering though if the government forcing higher education institutions is the way. I think there needs to be an intrinsic motivation where like there is a dialogue that is open and where they realize that is in a mutual interest to start studying it and it's not just a policy that's implemented and forced down upon because if it's only a one-way street I'm not sure it's as successful and if we have two parties who willingly agree and come to the consensus that this is the path to follow and realize that if we don't tackle it now then we're going to have an even bigger problem um, in 10 years then I think if both parties agree that would be the most efficient way for it to work. Yeah, yeah. I think it's nice that you kind of presented these two different, uh, different ideas or two different answers. Where, where do you stand in between the two? Uh, I think that if, we are, if the government and if the European Union is serious about what we said we were going to do, this whole Fit for 55 project of the European Union, that's, that's revolutionary. And if the government starts doing re revolutionary things, then I think it would be very remarkable if science uh, education <laughs> stays out of that. I mean, that would really not be their role in society. They should, they should really be part of that, that movement, or, or at least think about it and criticize it or support yeah. it or whatever. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, sorry. <coughs> I do not have COVID. I promise you that. <laughs> We're going to head on to the, the, the second statement. I'm going to cough again. <coughs> sorry. Um, the second statement is uh, one of the key areas of improvement uh, related to the climate crisis is making sure that we educate professionals uh, that are ready to, to tackle these issues. We talked before about the technical uh, personnel that we need, but it's also obviously much more than that. We need people that are ready to, to solve the climate crisis in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you mentioned a little bit before. Uh, so professions that focus, professions that focus on the environment, uh, sustainability and climate change in general, um, this is also one of the focus areas of the, plan, the new plans of Minister Jette, who's our new Minister of Climate Change and Energy, um, for the next couple of years. So do you think higher education institutions uh, have done enough the past few years? And how can we realistically accelerate what they've already been doing uh, to make sure that we fill the gap of people that we need to solve these climate crises hands-on? I think what will, of course, trigger is all the research programs that governments or the European Union is supporting. Uh, if I'm correct, I think that Minister Yet is also following <coughs> the footsteps of the UK and setting up some committee for climate change, which is a scientific committee. So that will probably also fuel it. Uh, we, as a, as a directorate, for example, are asking an advisory board to come up with, a, with, 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 with an advice for, uh, for a truly green growth. So I think the, the, the questions that they'll get from the government and, and, and the opportunities that we create for research will steer, steer it, steer it in, 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 in a certain way. Yeah. Right. But is that fast enough? Because obviously we talked a little bit before about the statement that Tiffany presented, that we need people within the next couple of years. Is it enough to just do that, or, or do we need some, some other tactic? Yeah, but for example, one of the things that we did in, in Glasgow was is, is, is deciding to phase out fossil fuel subsidies for projects abroad. Uh, that, that, that has a big impact on companies, and it's, it's not going to be easy. And for that transition, because I really hope, because for example, it affects also serious Dutch renowned companies, but, but for that transition, they will need a lot of intelligence and they will also need they, they will also require people to hire and uh, require to hire new people yeah, yeah. for that transition so I, I find it as, as a government as a government representative I find it very hard to say something like you have to change your curriculum like X Y and Z mm -hmm. but on the other hand it's not without reason that there is a nice that there is a nice benchmark so you know benchmarks also play a role if it goes fast enough, I don't know. I know it, it, we cannot only rely on, on education to have this change. It, it's, it's really a whole of government approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that something you agree with, uh, Tim? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I see that there is already a lot of knowledge. 
Uh, so we know um, for a um, big part of the solutions what we, uh, where we have to deal with to solve the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, we already know. Uh, the knowledge is there uh, for, let's say, 75% uh, or something like that. But um, the transfer of knowledge to society, to businesses, to governments, uh, uh, that is not going uh, fast enough. So, and therefore, I think we need much more also social scientists because we have we have been focusing a lot on the on the solutions, uh, technical solutions, nature-based solutions, uh, transforming the food system, but but how to uh, accelerate this uh, on a very large scale? Therefore, we need uh, social science. How to do that and how to convince policymakers to uh, and and businesses to to move in another direction? That's very difficult, and that's not going fast enough. There, we need to put our effort now. I think. Yeah. Josh, is this something that you recognize from the UK? Is, there, is it also a big problem there of just having not enough people to, to help solve this climate crisis, practically? Um, I think it's, it is definitely going to be something that holds, holds people back, because when you set targets for 2030, that's less than 10 years away, um, and to fully train people in certain industries will easily take that long. So unless it gets started soon, there's going to be an issue where you're trying to put in policy, but there's no people to implement those policies. Um, I think, sort of coming back to some of the stuff that was said earlier about higher education, universities appear to care a lot about league tables and rankings. Um, for better or for worse, lots of people use that to work out which universities they want to go to. Um, and academic freedom is really important. So um, whether league tables could be used as a method to not force, but to give an incentive for universities to incorporate these sorts of changes that could help with that transition to provide staff and, and people that can help with this transition over the, in the next 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, that could be something that might push universities without actually forcing them to. Because I feel like it, if it's voluntary, it's going to come across much better. It feels like the atmosphere from when you've voluntarily done stuff is going to feel a lot more positive than if you, oh, we're only doing this to tick a box. And I think students will notice that. Yeah. I mean, this just makes me instantly think, obviously, of the work that Tiffany's doing, because you, uh, with Students for Tomorrow, you founded uh, Duurzame Studies.nl or SustainableStudies.nl. Uh, is this something that you recognize that Josh said, that we just need to maybe put a grade on every university's door and then maybe try and force them that way to, to try and become the best or the most sustainable and, and uh, have them race it out uh, in that way? Um, well, I think what we've seen a lot with um, sustainable studies is that universities want to promote um, studies that cover the area of sustainability because there is more interest and it's also a very good marketing um, perspective and I say this because we have a screening process so universities submit studies that they believe um, fit the boxes and then we put them on the website if they do. Um, so we look for example if they cover the SDGs, if they cover planetary boundaries and what we've been noticing is that we have to turn away some studies because um, having one lecture in a three-year program that addresses climate change does not make your program um, sustainable and it's unfortunate but it's true so there is this concern of greenwashing that's arising but then just to build on what Josh said we have um, the sustainable ranking of universities where Students for Morgue is working on and we have seen that so just maybe to clarify a little bit, it's a process where we look in the different perspectives, both curriculum-wise and institution-wise, as to how well universities are integrating um, sustainability in their running. This can be the use of renewable energy, and this can also be um, if sustainability as a topic is included in the programs. And we have seen that every year we uh, make this ranking public. And at first, universities might be a little reticent to participate, then the ranking becomes public and then all these universities that were a little bit concerned at first because they didn't want to participate, it was too much time. The next year, they're making very, very big policy changes and you see some universities who are climbing up the rankings who were very bad the first time they took part and then it took one ranking to incentivize them to suddenly decide that, okay, maybe we need to care, we need to care more, and I think that that kind of incentives are a great way to push higher education institutions towards positive change. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, I see that there's some questions in the audience. Uh, 
they're right in the middle, Lisanna, so <laughs> you'll, you'll have to find your way to them. But yes, perfect. Thanks a lot. Hi, can, can you, you introduce me? yourself before? Uh, uh, yeah, so my name is Borci Jager and I'm studying culture, anthropology, sustainable citizenship here at Utrecht University. And a lot of things has been said on sustainability and the climate crisis here. So this question might be funny to ask now, but what do you mean by sustainability? What is a sustainable mindset for you? And do you direct that question to someone specifically? To everyone who is <laughs> inspired here to talk about sustainability. Anyone who wants to answer that question, what is sustainability for you? <laughs> I mean, okay. I think I might have been the first person to say the phrase sustainable <clears throat> mindset on the panel. Um, and I think by that I meant um, my degree is engineering, um, particularly <coughs> mechanical engineering. So lots of it is about making decisions about um, which bit of something should you make more efficient, what material should you swap. Um, and normally when you choose a material, the first question you're supposed to ask is, how much does it cost? And then everything else comes second. And I think for me, a sustainable mindset would be what's going to be the best for the lifetime of this product, what's going to have the least damaging impact to the environment, and then think of cost second. So I think for me, it would be changing, changing it from let's make money to let's not kill the planet. For me, that would be, uh, put simply, how I would approach that. Anyone in the panel that severely disagrees or agrees? Well, to be honest... I don't like the word uh, sustainability that much <clears throat> because it's it's uh, it's an old world uh, old word <laughs> that is misused a lot. What is your proposal for another word? Um, well, regeneration is 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 the, is the next step, I think, and uh, okay. I think we have to move to work towards regeneration. So uh, uh, sustainability is um, doing less harm, and regeneration is making the world better and eh? improving the world. And if you connect that to the biosphere where this nature-based uh, thinking is, is, um, is involved. And um, uh, so a, a sustainable way should be um, uh, not doing harm to the environment. And the regenerative way should be uh, creating a better environment. And uh, that's the way we have to move towards, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Zhuzia, do you have uh, any thoughts on this? How do you see sustainability? <laughs> Um, I also don't have great connotations of the word sustainability. I think um, sometimes it allows us to escape addressing what this is, which is a climate crisis. I think we can sometimes use sustainability to, to make it sound more friendly or maybe make it sound easier to address. And actually, I think um, not in all cases, but in some cases that can lead to so the sort of the greenwashing we were talking about or trying to take the easy route or the simple, more simple route. Um, and I think that there's definitely a time and a place, but the time and place to win right now is that we need to sort of address what's happening um, face on rather than sort of try and avoid it. Yeah, yeah. Is that a, an answer to your question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought your neighbors also had a question. Or yep. yeah, my name is Mar Santos. I also st study here at Utrecht, and I study sustainable development. And my question is targeted at Renee and Sophie, but anyone also feel free to answer. Um, how realistic do you think? What is actually green growth for you? How realistic do you think it is? If we have this crisis right now, shouldn't we be focusing on? degrowing, shouldn't we be focusing on producing less rather than producing more? Because we don't have the technologies yet that make it completely sustainable. My, my, the focus of our work is, is, is poorer countries. So in, in that sense, I disagree strongly with you because I think those people really deserve a much more well, uh, much better life and for that they need some kind of growth and, and that's why we were trying to promote green growth by promoting uh, sustainable energy sources like solar, or we're trying to provide them with water and sanitation, or uh, information about nutrition, or clean cooking, because because the lack of the lack of clean cooking uh, opportunities in Africa causes a lot of death and 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 and, and bad health. Uh, so so in Africa we definitely need more growth in order to 
give people a, a basic living to create basic living conditions here in Europe it's, it's, it's more open to discussion but then of course it's also about the quality of growth and therefore I think everybody agrees that GDP per capita is not really the uh, indicator for 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 well-being so so I think in Europe uh, we're, we're, we're more open to a sort of broad broader discussion on it but but let's say the the, 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 the continent that we're focusing on and, and the countries that we're focusing on are really the poorest in poor countries and they need more growth. Is that how you see that as well Sophie? Yeah I actually completely agree with Rene I think it's very important to highlight that I mean we're not working for the Ministry of Education we're working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs so we're working with um, especially countries um, that still need to develop and need to grow and um, it's important that that happens in a green or sustainable or regenerative or whatever way you want to call it way um, so um, in my work I also mostly focus on adaptation and in those countries it's very important to adapt to climate change in order to um, grow in a green way so that um, I mean infrastructure for example is uh, a basic necessity in order to to function as a society and if climate change increases and those infrastructures um, will be broken for example because of excessive rainfall then um, a country is not able to grow so that's why it's very important to adapt to climate change in order for the people to or the economy to grow but also as Rene said to just provide basic uh, life necessities yeah yeah, um, I, I see that there's still some hands up, but I do want to move on to Zuzia now because she's been she's been waiting and she's zooming in all the way <laughs> from Nairobi. So I do want to talk to you as well. Um, you are uh, a working professional, but you are also obviously an alumnus from Oxford University, uh, if I'm correct. Um, you have also you you've obviously seen up close how a particular university uh, can invest in the climate de debate, and also how you, as a student, particularly can contribute to that. Um, now, with your experience as a young professional, uh, how do you look back on those years and those efforts? And what do you think are the main, what do you think are the main improvements uh, that the higher education field could make? Um, yeah, it's been really interesting actually reflecting on um, my experience in higher education and sort of how that played a role in, in what I do now. And I actually did my undergraduate in the US and, and my master's in the UK. So I've had a little bit of a comparative experience in that sense. And I would say that I'm someone who was a bit of a latecomer to climate action, although I don't think you can be, there's, there's no such thing as being too late, but um, I, I wasn't super involved in, in climate activism on campus, which I think says a lot about the lack of um, opportunities to be able to, to make progress in that way at the different institutions I was at. And um, one of the, the main things that I think is, is vital for any university or higher ed any higher education institute talking about climate action is, is really divestment. You know, there are billions and billions of dollars of university endowments still invested in, in fossil fuel companies. And I think that, you know, when it comes to campuses, personally, you know, you can make all the measures you'd like in the world around sustainability and replacing plastic straws and making sure recycling is available etc um, but if you're still actively investing in, in fossil fuel companies then i think it's um it's not going to balance out in the long run and so a lot of the climate activism that i saw on campus um, when i was a student was very much around divestment and i know that in the uk roughly half of, of British universities have committed to divesting, but how many of those have actually um, gone the full way is, is yet to be seen. And I also think that... No, sorry, sorry. I just wanted, to, I just wanted to, to, to move on, or not move on, but kind of tag along with that, because one of the questions that I wanted to ask you as well was uh, that in December of last year, it was actually published that UK universities still take uh, or, or, ha or receive 89 million pounds per year from major oil companies. And I'm interested in your opinion on whether that should be prohibited uh, for big higher education institutions like these. 
Yeah, I mean, I think if there can be regulation around it, then, then definitely. I think there's also a, a piece around sort of educating students that, um, you know, they are paying money in a lot of cases, obviously, depending on financial circumstances and which universities and which countries they're attending university in, and to be at that university. And I think just as we're having more of a conversation around, you know, the role of our pensions and that we actually can use the power of having a pension to sort of make a stance and, and say something about where uh, money is going. I think also on university campuses for students to recognize that, you know, they, they do have uh, they do have power um, in this space because if they're paying tuition fees and that's money that is directly potentially going into um, into fossil fuels. So I think there's, there's an education piece to be done around that. And so, as you said, potentially regulation as well. Um, I think, so, so my academic background was very much in the social sciences. I, I studied um, political science at undergrad and I studied migration studies um, for my master's. And I think it wasn't until maybe one class in my last semester of my master's program um, did I talk about climate um, in, the, in the context of climate refugees. So I, I do think that there needs to be more climate woven through the curriculum of different subjects and for climate careers to be seen as more accessible. I think um, a lot of people still see it very much that if you want to be in the climate space, you have to come from a science background or an engineering background or potentially even a geography background. But actually there are so many different routes into, into careers that have a climate focus from all sorts of different backgrounds. And, the reality is that every career in the future will have to be thinking about climate and so we need to be making sure that the education people are receiving includes that and, and as part of that I think there needs to be a little bit of more of a pedagogical shift to how higher education institutes um, collaborate and partner with universities and higher education institutes um, outside of, of Europe and the US and you know there's a lot of um, knowledge that can be that there's a lot that can be learned from um universities in the global south that are, are really on the front lines of climate impacts and and climate vulnerabilities and so i'd love to see universities be doing more in collaboration with uh, those institutions and also making sure that they're supporting their international students who may be facing climate shocks back home, but also all students who may be facing sort of eco-anxiety or some of the mental health challenges that come um, with the climate crisis. And, and also those, you know, as I said, I was super involved when I was on campus, but I can imagine sort of just the, the time commitment and the energy commitment that many young people uh, are contributing towards climate action is, you know, taking away from their studies. And I think universities can play a really important role in supporting them with that. Yeah, I can imagine, René, from, from your point of view, that as uh, your director, you could play a role in connecting these higher education institutes here in the Netherlands, maybe, to the institutions abroad. Is that something that you're already doing? Yeah, we invest every year 25 million euros in, in promoting, for example, a network of research institutes worldwide to promote uh, food security worldwide. And of course, also there increasingly, uh, the, the, the reducing greenhouse gases has been mainstreamed into that thinking. And when one of our partners is, for example, Wageningen University, but we also connect to a lot of research centers, is centers in Africa. So that is one of the examples in which we try to work with education and, 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 and science in, 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 in the countries in the South. Right. Yeah. Okay, I mean, that, that is hopeful, uh, at least. Um, I, I was wondering as well, Juja, you have experience now as a professional. Um, do you think the professional world or, or community could learn something from uh, the higher education institutions and maybe also the other way around? So can uh, higher education institutions learn something from the professional community? Yeah, I, I think we can all learn to better incorporate climate into to any of our learning and our work. Um, I think it still is quite quite siloed out, and so I think um, both sort of the professional world and higher education institutions can learn in that sense. Um, I think in the professional, oh sorry, is one of the two, in your opinion, better at at going against these silos? Um, 
I don't know. It's such a just the professional world is so big and broad. That I'm sure that there are there are different sectors and industries that are doing better or worse. Um, I think, and um, to the point that was made earlier around sort of need tables, I think the the professional world, to use that term, or sort of the business world, is slowly waking up and having to be held accountable by both sort of its own employees and um, the public at large. And we're seeing more and more metrics come out to sort of how to judge a company when it comes to their net zero ambitions or their climate claims. And I think that um, being able to to apply that to universities as well, like different accountability measures um, in the form of, you know, sustainable lead tables or green lead tables or whatever that may be, it could be something that um, universities can learn from the professional world. Yeah. I think I want to want to f- finish this this conversation quickly before we head up to the envi- for to the environment. I was going to say, but to the audience for a couple more questions. Um, is obviously here in the room uh, and you yourself and here in the panel. We have a, a couple of young uh, student voices that uh, are, are are looking to get heard more and and have something contri- to contribute. Do you think these young student voices have something have something to contribute? Should they do, be listened to more, or do you think they they've been given too big? of a stage. I mean, this stage is normally sized, but... <laughs> no, opinion. absolutely. I mean, I think this goes back to the conversation that was very prevalent around COP. It, you know, it's one thing to sort of give a person a seat at the table, but then also be able to um, have them contribute to the conversation that's being had at that table. And so I think really being able to distinguish between um, what is sort of like superficial tokenistic tick boxing of youth involvement in different policies or practices um, versus really engaged participation and actually um, driving forward the conversation and leading the conversation. So I definitely think young people have a really important role to play and should be heard more. I I also don't think it should be the responsibility of young people to be pushing this agenda. Um, I don't think young people at university should have to be spending their time trying to convince their their university to divest from fossil fuels. That really should be something that um, the university management should be focusing on and should be leading because it's in the interest of everyone. And so I think we we can learn a lot from, from students on university campuses, but we should be hesitant about putting so much pressure on them to be leading the way when there are lots of other people in the room that can also be sort of making making these changes. Yeah. I, I hear Rene whisper, I agree. Maybe you have one, <laughs> one more piece of advice uh, for, to actually make sure that we avoid the tokenism. How do we make sure that youth are engaged meaningfully? Um, I think it's about having them set the agenda. Um, it's not about setting an agenda and then bringing them into the conversation, but having them p- part of every single step of the process. And so I was the, the UK's delegate to the Y7, which is the G7's youth summit, where I covered climate. And it was really important to be able to have continual conversations with policymakers and be pushing them and challenging them on the things that they were saying and the things that they were doing. And also at the same time, remembering that, you know, I'm, I'm a young person and I can talk from my own experiences, but I don't represent all young people in the UK. And so making sure that also as a young person in those positions that I am holding myself accountable to be made to making sure that I am trying to understand as best as possible the diversity and variety of perspectives that young people have in my country, but also across the world. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful message to, to end this uh, this conversation with. Uh, let young people set the agenda, not just in higher education, but also in poli- during policy making. Um, I, I, I'm kind of looking at the team. Do we have time for one more question? Yes? Oh, thumbs up. That's great. Do we have one more question? Make it a good one. <laughs> Here at the front. Hi, thank you. Um, so uh, the panel's talked a lot about getting the right people with the right skills to now implement the solutions that there's been a lot of discussion about. And the UK Department for Education recently released a white paper where they said they were going to uh, 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 
defund quite a lot of um, arts programs at UK higher education institutions. And they were going to reinvest at least some of this money into science, technology, engineering, and maths projects uh, and courses. Does the panel think that this is a correct or a necessary solution to the climate problem? Interesting question. Is anyone looking to answer that first? I'm Josh. Happy, I'm happy to give it a go. Yeah. Um, I think that we've mentioned about how climate seems quite siloed. Um, and I, as someone who's doing, I want to be going into renewable energy engineering, something that is one of the professions that people look at and say they'll tackle the problem. Um, I don't like that approach of siloing it. I think it should be something that everybody's on board with and it doesn't just get delegated to small groups of people. Um, as someone who is doing STEM and would benefit from that, <laughs> I'm going to say that I don't like it because by removing, by focusing on STEM and including climate in that at the expense of humanities and arts, you're, you're saying that the, the government values STEM over those subjects and I don't think that's right. Um, humanities and arts and communication add so much to quality of life. You might not be able to measure it with a carbon target, but it matters a lot to people. And actually, as we've already mentioned before, it's, it's a lot of those subjects that are about sort of communicating and communicating lots of this fairly complicated science across to people. And if you suddenly don't have that, like, there's no, there's no good like, what science you've got if you can't actually explain it or if, if people aren't on board with it because they see it as that's the reason that we now don't have dot, dot, dot. So I don't think making cuts in whole areas of education to then include climate in is a good way to get people on board. It's just going to make people turn against it as that's the reason that we now don't have dot, dot, dot. So I, I don't think it's a good strategy. Um, I think it's important to have a continued focus on some of the technical solutions, but not at the expense of other stuff, including nature-based. Yeah, nice. Uh, Zhuja, I saw your hand. Yeah, um, I just wanted to echo what just Josh said. Um, I think arts can play a huge role in um, climate solutions and also in what I was talking about earlier around like sort of eco-anxiety and how to express and process and articulate and how you're feeling about the climate crisis. I think taking money away from those those spaces is also really harmful to young people who only have access to, to that sort of learning through uh, formal education. And I think it's one of the points that I think about a lot is that we already have a lot of inaccessibility to higher education and a lot of inequalities in our education system and in society in general. And as we transition to this green economy and we talk about green jobs and green skills and green education, like how do we make sure we bring everyone along with us? and it isn't a um, exclusive space that sort of just replicates some of the hierarchies that already exist and I think by moving money away from spaces like the arts um, just furthers that potential inequality in the climate space. Yeah, I think beautifully said. Tim, you can make the final remarks. Very short, <coughs> but if, if you need some one thing at this moment is, is imagination. And mm. uh, in, in, in our society, there's a huge <coughs> lack of imagination. If you look at the future, we only see um, uh, floods, uh, wildfires, uh, terrible things. But we need imagination. We need to imagine how uh, a sustainable or regenerative future looks like. And uh, well, we need creative thinkers for that, so it's, it's really stupid to, to cut money from, uh, from creative thinkers, I think. Great. We'll send this recording to the UK government. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your question. Uh, and that was the panel for today. Um, I, I think we can, we can hold this conversation for much longer. Uh, I think there's hours, of more, hours more of things that we could discuss. But I think we've already grasped uh, in the hours that we had uh, some very important topics and, and we reached some important conclusions, namely that uh, investing in, in higher education uh, isn't necessarily where we need to put priority, but we definitely shouldn't take money away. And we need to go against the siloing and uh, we, in the end we will need everybody. So we need them quick and we need everyone. I think that's a, <laughs> I think that's a good solution uh, or a good conclusion to make. Um, I just want to thank everyone here on the panel and thank everyone in the audience. But the real thank you uh, will come from uh, Jennifer Cosgrave, who is the director of the British Council Netherlands. And she'll come to the stage now. Give her a warm welcome.
and uh, I'll hand the mic to you. Thank you so much and good afternoon everyone. So yes, as the country director for the British Council in the Netherlands, it is my privilege to close today's proceedings. As many of you will know, the British Council is the UK's organisation for cultural relations and educational opportunities. And our job is to build spaces for trust and understanding between um, people in the UK and the countries in which we have a presence through our work in education, the English language and arts and culture. And so we're really committed to convening crucial conversations between the best of the UK and the best of the Netherlands on some of the most important issues that are facing the human family today. And for me, um, this event today and this conversation that we've been having is an example of that commitment in action. But today's event and today's panel discussion is not a standalone event. The knowledge that you have generously shared with us and the questions that we've been grappling with form part of the British Council's global network of action on the climate crisis. And if you would like to know more about that work of the British Council, um, please check out, uh, you can Google British Council Climate Connection or come and talk to us in the bar after about that work. The Glasgow Climate Pact recognises that partnership is crucial if we are going to realise uh, a regenerative future. And I'd therefore like to take a moment to thank our partners without whom this event would not have been possible. So thank you to all of our colleagues at the British Embassy and particularly Lucy Ferguson for opening our event today. Um, Thank you to our wonderful moderator, Anik Monen, and I would actually like to um, really be able to give you a small token of our gratitude for uh, facilitating such a fantastic discussion today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bravo. <laughs> And we have similar tokens of gratitude to the rest of our panel. Unfortunately, our wonderful panel members, uh, Dr. Ria Dunkley and Juja Mamri, we will send you our thanks virtually. Um, also, thank you so much to Tim Van Hatten. <laughs> Renee Van Hill. <laughs> Tiffany Sep Septier. Josh Trigal and Sophie DeWitt. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, I cannot uh, miss this opportunity to thank uh, the fantastic team at the British Council. You curate and facilitate and make sure these events happen smoothly. Um, so I want to take a moment to say thank you to Anna Davy and thank you to Jodie for this event today. Um, and finally, thank you to all of you in the audience, both live and online, for joining us today to form part of this incredibly important discussion. Um, if you're interested in more British Council events and networks, please do visit our website uh, and sign up for our monthly newsletters and also come and find us and keep this conversation going on in the bar after. Um, thank you ever so much. Safe travels, stay well and healthy, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you.